welcome back, uh, fellows, and welcome everybody uh, to our to our talk today. We are uh, inviting into our virtual lecture hall, our virtual room, Joshua Yaffa, um, who will be joining Professor Michael Kimmage in uh, the lecture today entitled "Writing About Russia: Books and Book Reviews." Uh, I'll do a, a short little introduction, and then I will uh, pass the floor to to Joshua Yaffa to to start his um, his talk. So Joshua Yaffa uh, spent his fellowship year um, at New America working on his book, uh, Between Two Fires, Truth, Ambition, and Compromise in Putin's Russia, which uh, is recommended reading, uh, and you should all have a copy of that. Uh, it was published in January of 2020. Uh, his book uh, looks at the lives of several Russians and the inevitable accommodation that they must reach within the system around them. He's currently based in Moscow, where he's correspondent for The New Yorker, uh, though this information may be a bit uh, behind the times. Joshua, apologize, as uh, COVID-19 has changed where people are based. Um, uh, but he has also reported from Russia for Bloomberg, Business Week, The Economist, National Geographic, The New Republic, and The New York Times Magazine. For his work in Russia, he has been the finalist for a Livingston Award a visiting scholar at the Harriman Institute at Columbia University and received a grant from the Pulitzer Center for Crisis Reporting. He was previously an associate editor at Foreign Affairs. He is a graduate of the Georgetown School of Foreign Service and holds a master's degree in journalism and international affairs from Columbia University. So please give a warm MSSR 2020 welcome to Joshua Yaffa. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks, for, thanks for having me. Well, uh, thanks as well on my behalf, Josh. It's, it's wonderful to be, um, to be with you virtually and to have the opportunity to discuss Russian topics and, uh, and books and book reviewing uh, with our wonderful group of fellows. So I propose that we just uh, jump right in. What we'll do, uh, as I think everybody knows, is that Josh and I will have a conversation now for, I think, you know, sort of 30, 32 minutes or so. We'll take a 10 minute break and then you'll have a good hour uh, to talk with Josh about themes that we raise or themes that we didn't raise and you think are uh, important to, uh, to raise. Um, you know, we've been focusing on U.S.-Russian relations, Josh, and diplomacy, but uh, you know, I think it's clear that much uh, uh, other material is relevant uh, both to your, uh, to your writing and to our concerns uh, in this symposium. So let me start uh, with a question that kind of reviews uh, a bit of what we've done already this week. And I wanted to return uh, to a presentation that we saw, but uh, uh, was on, on, on Monday uh, from the Russian journalist or Russian American journalist, Vladimir Posner. Uh, and there he went back to the early 20th century to caricatures and cartoons uh, of sort of Russian Bolshevik vintage, but also of uh, American vintage, the sort of corpulent cigar smoking capitalist that was a Soviet caricature uh, of the American and then the kind of thuggish civilization killing um, Bolshevik that was uh, an American stereotype uh, of the Russian. And basically he argued that this has sort of been happening for 100 and 120 years, that these two countries have been manufacturing stereotypes. Uh, and he blamed the establishment in both countries for this. I'm not quite sure what he meant by the establishment. Uh, but that was his explanation. The establishment has a vested interest in these two countries uh, in creating negative images. And the specific question I want to ask, because he mentioned uh, your journalistic home, The New Yorker, he said it would be very difficult to find in The New York Times or The Washington Post or The New Yorker a sort of positive image uh, of Russia. And he mentioned, you know, Moscow and how lovely it is. Uh, in his view, this uh, sort of doesn't come across uh, in, uh, in Western journalism. I just wanted to begin by asking you to respond to that. It only feels fair since he <laughs> made that criticism and it was a criticism on his part uh, of the New Yorker. It seems only fair that the New Yorker gets a chance to respond or uh, uh, you on the New Yorker's behalf, but uh, he's raising a kind of broader issue that I think is, uh, is worth addressing from the outset. So that's my first, uh, first question to you about uh, images, stereotypes, and, and uh, the degree to which you think Posner may have a point or where you would want to qualify or, or modify his criticism. Uh, sure, thanks. Um, thanks for that. And uh, I, th I think he certainly does have a point, um, up to a point, I guess I would, I would say. There's part of that that I find uh, 
inarguably um, accurate or, or, or correct or rings true with my own um, experience. And, and then and there's part of that critique that I think is particular to the way that Russia is uh, viewed and, and written about and covered in the Western press. And part of that actually just comes down to the nature of journalism. And here I think that Posner himself, a very experienced journalist, probably knows better. Um, I think maybe he's, he's um, hamming it up or, uh, a little bit when it comes to being kind of aggrieved or, or confused about why Russia is covered uh, in this way when he understands very well the nature of journalism. And so I'll begin with the part that's just not Russia specific, but rather universal journalism and get that over with quickly so we can get to the Russia specific bit. And that is just, um, there isn't really much of a practice of articles in the New Yorker or articles really anywhere about um, places that essentially function smoothly, efficiently, where things just work. Um, it's a constant complaint about journalism and maybe, and maybe a fair one um, that's worth talking about, but that's not really a conversation about Russia. That's just a conversation about why uh, journalism works the way it does and the kinds of stories that are interesting to journalists and to writers. A story about a city that's generally pleasant to live in where public transportation works and you can have a nice quality of life. It's a hard story for me to imagine pitching, not because my editors are so hell bent against good news from Russia, but like we don't run stories about how nice it is to live in Stockholm. I mean, it's just, um, <laughs> it's just not a journalistic genre for lots of reasons that have nothing to do with Russia that um, is, has a particularly rich or established history. And I'm not even sure that readers necessarily want that, at least from the New Yorker. But anyway, that's, we'll, we'll sort of move through that quickly because that's not really about um, Russia. That's a bigger conversation. Um, about journalism. I mean, I, I'm tempted to, to protest with some specificity based on my own articles and coverage in The New Yorker, since at least in part, the critique was uh, directed, it sounds like, specifically at, at The New Yorker, among other um, places. And, and one of the last long features I wrote from Russia for The New Yorker was about this small town that I've come to love, uh, Tarusa, uh, where I've spent a lot of time in recent years and the kind of wonderful, rich, erudite, warm characters who populate the place. And in particular, it was really a profile of someone there who's become a friend, a kind of neo-Chekhovian doctor turned writer of short fiction. Of course, the doctor, Maxim Osipov, encounters all sorts of bureaucratic um, inefficiencies or, or deficiencies in his work as a doctor and, and, and addresses that in his fiction as well. So it's not as if it's a completely rosy picture of Russia, some of the more unpleasant or difficult facts about Russia and life, especially in the more rural regions is all present. But on the whole, I would think that's actually a pretty, um, it comes across as a sympathetic and certainly humanistic portrait of the place. It's, uh, I would be hard pressed uh, or be shocked if anyone read that and thought it was a kind of anti-Russian or, or um, politicized screed. It was really a, a humanistic um, uh, portrait. Um, and, and I don't write that many articles, long feature articles for the magazine every year, right? So that's like one out of three articles I wrote last year was this um, humanistic uh, portrayal of uh, this um, small town. And I just, in the defense uh, of colleagues, say at the New York Times, um, there's lots of stories actually in the New York Times about, um, about Moscow urban improvements. I um, uh, just went on a long bike ride actually last night with Anton Tranovsky, who we, we talked about his piece from last year or even the beginning of this year about stroganina, the kind of delicious frozen sushi of the Russian North. And uh, a place like the New York Times because it can publish so frequently, actually there's many more pieces than perhaps someone like Posner realizes about things like the um, delicious, somewhat bizarre food items for the American reader that people eat in Yakutia. And they're actually, I think it's just wrong to, um, to only sees uh, to look at the also very good and very necessary long investigations of you know Russia's um, geopolitical footprint abroad. Uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning work that the Times did last year involving um, Russian meddling in, in Africa, not only um, uh, its uh, military intelligence assassination squads in, in Europe. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm very glad uh, and grateful as a reader that the Times does that work, but I just think it's, it's wrong analytically to, to think of that and to just sort of exclude all these other pieces that maybe don't get the same attention, um, don't get the same uh, level of uh, prizes, but that's a separate 
then it's kind of the, the critique is not quite directed at the same place. The, the, the journalists and editors at the Times actually are, I think, doing a pretty good job of bringing um, Russia to life. That said, I do think that um, there is an unavoidable or rather undeniable Putin centricity to American coverage of Russia. That, that strikes me as obvious and, and inarguable and, and lamentable because um, I don't think that uh, Putin psychoanalysis, which so often for lack of better repertorial um, access is essentially what we're doing as journalists because we don't uh, have access to the contents of his brain or, or what he said to a very small degree of uh, small number of inner circle people around him. So we are essentially kind of guessing or, or, or trying with some analysis um, and experience fill in the blanks, but sort of guess at what his motives or, or strategies may, may be. Um, and that is unfortunate because that doesn't really tell you all that much about what it's like to live and exist and work and be in Russia that doesn't really concern the everyday lives of Russian citizens. So it's a question I think of what actually the point of Western coverage from Russia is or should be, what do readers want? And, and here, I think um, that journalists in Russia are responding to actual reader demand. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated chicken or egg question in terms of, you know, are readers so fascinated by Putin because Western journalists have built Putin up into this um, a, a kind of mythological Bond supervillain who's just very interesting to read about because there's so much mythology around him or do readers themselves bring that kind of mythology to bear and, and they're wanting to read Putin pieces more than they're wanting to read pieces about Stroganina, the delicious frozen fish delicacy from, from Yakutia. Um, and the difference between covering Putin era Russia and this period that Posner was talking about or really the whole of the Soviet period is, is I think, and I wasn't really around as a reader and certainly not as a journalist in the Soviet period. So I could be a bit off in my comparison, but there is a degree of personalization um, to Russia's footprint in the world, at least, right? If you're an American or, or a Western reader interested in the way that Russia interfaces with the world, it really does come down uh, to what one man or at least one small, very group of men is thinking and the way they view the world and their strategies. It isn't actually a kind of whole of Russia um, matter. That's just the nature of the way power is and especially uh, foreign policy uh, is, is wielded in Russia today. That does come down to the calculations and urges, whims, um, strategies of, of one man or, or, or one man in a small um, inner circle. So I think it's unavoidably um, analytically correct to say if, if, if what you're concerned about is understanding the way that Russia acts in the world, the way it interfaces with the West, with the US, that really is a question of you know, what is going on with, with Putin and what are his calculations. I'm not sure that um, you know, going to Siberia or Vladivostok or the Caucasus gives you a lot of insight into that question. If, if that is indeed what you're interested in, and it would be fair if you're an American or Western reader that that is the thing you're most interested in. You're interested in kind of, you know, what is Russia doing in the world? What does Russia want to achieve and how will it act vis-a-vis -vis, um, the United States? In that question, all roads really do lead to Putin. And so um, I don't know if that results in character, right? And, and um, so maybe uh, Posner and I are talking past uh, one another bit. I'm talking about a kind of tendency toward Putin's centricity in American coverage, and he's talking about character. I actually see less character. I don't think that Russian, that journalism about Russia is filled with um, kind of cheap stereotypes of, uh, I don't know what, I don't know what Posner means by character. Of, I, I don't see a lot of descriptions of Russians, you know, swilling vodka, taking their bears for walks in the streets. I, I, don't, I don't know what he's suggesting by stereotype, but I don't see stereotyping of Russian so much. I do see this focus on Putin that does lead to, I think, gaps of understanding about what it's actually like to be Russian and live in Russia. And that is lamentable because if, if in addition to wanting to understand Russia's geopolitical aims and its likely geopolitical kind of footprint and, and machinations and how it's going to affect relations with the US and the US itself, 
that is a Putin-centric story, but if besides that readers also do care about the fabric and texture of life in Russia and, and domestic um, stories and, and trend lines and what's important to Russians themselves, that is boxed out of a lot of the coverage by this um, both understandable but also lamentable focus um, on Putin. I don't know if that's, you know, how much I ended up speaking directly to Posner's comments or not, but, th but that's what comes to mind when I think about these questions. You know, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful rebuttal. And if we had infinite time and, 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 and the means, it would be wonderful to have the two of you uh, talk about it together. But uh, it's a wonderful rebuttal to what, uh, to what he says. I have a related question. I just want to contextualize it a little bit that during the Cold War, there was uh, very substantial expertise uh, on Russia and the Soviet Union, academia, you know, government, uh, expert community. It's a common remark now that there's much less of that than there used to be 9-11 and a shift of priorities and um, <clears throat> a sense of Russia in the U.S. as of, of diminished importance. Uh, so that's perhaps missing, or maybe that's an objective fact and that's no longer uh, there. I think also during the Cold War, there were a lot of emigre voices. You think of the role of somebody like uh, Rostropovich, who emigrated, of course, but uh, was a kind of ambassador for uh, Russian culture in the city of Washington. Uh, and there were many, uh, many such figures. Uh, and, you know, the present moment, it feels like that bridge between the U.S. and Russia is fairly tenuous. And so it always makes me feel like your journalism is, um, is a very important aspect of that bridge. And so in that sense, I want to ask you about your own sense of either the American or the sort of English language audience that you write for. Uh, they're not uh, inundated with knowledge about Russia. I think that's fair to say. There's at the moment a great deal of interest. Sometimes it's of a somewhat, uh, you know, sort of uh, overwrought or overly politicized nature, but there's a lot of interest at the moment and there isn't uh, as much knowledge as there could be or should be. And so <laughs> how do you try to, to fill that space? How do you try to give these readers what they need when it comes to uh, when it comes to Russia? Sure. I mean, one thing that I thought of as you were talking was was um, something I wasn't able to add to that previous question, but is worth spending a moment on. And that, to me, there's the, the key difference between um, uh, U.S. Russian relations in, in, in the Cold War and now, and, and therefore in the way that we write about Russia now and, and readers think about Russia now is uh, in the Cold War, it, there was this notion of, of two rival uh, systems that, that Russia, or rather the Soviet Union, represented an entire alternative and, and rival system, and that that system had some um, cohesion to it or, or, or really was represented at various levels. And so um, Soviet citizens in all walks of life actually represented interesting objects of journalistic inquiry because they represented part of this larger um, system that, that kind of had aims of, of rivaling and, and surpassing the U.S. system. Now that's not really the case. I, Putinism doesn't have those same kind of aims or doesn't make those same um, claims, I guess I would say. It's not a coherent rival top-down system. It's not a way of organizing your life or society, right? What, what would be like the import of Putinism to a third country? It's not a kind of ready-made out of the box system like communism um, was. And so in that sense, um, the, the role or experience or lives of individuals within that system is, is naturally in a way less, I guess, Im important. I mean, that's a word I'm, I, I'm hesitant to use to say I, that the, the understanding of the lives of everyday Russians is less important. But again, if, if what we're interested in or what readers are interested in is Russia's kind of geopolitical um, footprint, right? There's less, um, of a kind of top-down cohesion to the Putin system than there was to the Soviet uh, system. It doesn't have that same airs of, of being a rival, wholly kind of uh, um, coherent or, or cohesive um, worldview or, or ideology or system. So therefore, the roles of individuals are less important if you're, again, if you're trying to understand kind of what Russia, how Russia acts in the world isn't necessarily going to be represented by um, individual um, uh, portraits, though, as when we get to the subject of my book, I, I, I do, in a sense, make a, um, a different argument um, in, in my book that there is something to be said for that bottom-up approach for understanding Russia, not through the lens of Putin, but of the people who, through tacit, um, uh, their kind of tacit participation, uh, make that, give that system its 
um, durability. But anyway, that's a long um, lead in to answering the, the question at hand, which is how I, I think about um, my audience or, or, or what is important or interesting um, to get across. I mean, I do always try and sneak in at least these nuggets of what it's actually like to be here, to live here, to be Russian at this moment in time. Uh, I say sneak in, that's really concerning work in, in the New Yorker, the book I, I hope was kind of frontally and largely about that. Um, uh, so maybe we, we can sort of separate the, the, the two. For the New Yorker, I tend to write notwithstanding pieces about um, small towns and you know, the doctor turned writers who, who live in them, um, I do tend to write more directly on politics, on geopolitics, uh, investigations um, about uh, either figures or events of a political nature um, in, uh, in Russia. I guess, though, whatever, whatever genre I'm working in, I, I try and demystify the place. I think that there's mm -hmm. a lot of, as I spoke about in my opening, uh, in, the, in my response to the first question, a kind of mythologization of Putin, mythologization of Putin that makes him seem a character somehow separate or apart from our uh, reality and, 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 um, and therefore kind of by extension, the people who live in Russia, Russians are also somehow seen as kind of um, uh, are, are otherized, I guess, their experiences are otherized because Putin has become this figure of not just fascination, but, but has been turned into, into something kind of um, not of our um, sphere or, or not of our um, kind of um, culture. Um, and I try uh, in, in my more kind of frontally political pieces, geopolitical pieces, pieces about Putin to see if I can't explain his logic or to the extent it's understandable or available uh, to me kind of on its, on its own terms to make, um, to, to sort of it, it, rather than be in some sort of, um, uh, I guess, uh, implicit uh, conflict um, with uh, with geopolitical kind of strategy in, in of Russia and the Putin um, era, to sort of get inside it and understand it and, and take it on its own terms and understand its logic and how it seems and looks to its uh, participants and um, practitioners. And, and, and I remember this most sharply or this, this, the, the, the opposing way of uh, writing about Russia uh, and what I wanted to avoid became more clear to me in 2014 during or after the annexation of Crimea and Russia's support for the um, war in, in Donbass uh, that summer. I felt like there was a lot of analysis and writing about Russia that essentially was, um, for lack of a better word, confused about why was Putin acting in this way. This was so clearly against his interests, um, especially as sanctions mounted, as Russia was increasingly uh, isolated, as the country took an economic hit uh, for Putin's actions abroad. There was a lot of confusion and mystification about, you know, why would Putin act uh, this way? And, and I felt like it was actually pretty un understandable if you could have got inside his head a bit and saw the way the world works from his perspective. And so from that point, I've always tried to, to write with that approach in mind and to write with that kind of tone and, and, and viewpoint to, um, uh, to explain both Putin's individual actions on the world stage or, or domestically and also Russia um, writ large as a geopolitical actor by understanding how things um, look from here, the, the experiences, the history, the traumas, the memory uh, and the calculations that go into say Russian um, foreign policy, which often looks different than the way that someone in Washington or elsewhere in the West kind of understands what Russia's interests should be. I guess that's it in a nutshell, right? I think there's a lot of writing about uh, analysis of Russia's interests, essentially extending what a Western politician's interests are or should be to Putin, and then you end up in a state of um, confusion. Um, but at the same time, I, I try and uh, when it comes to the lives of everyday Russians uh, to present them as uh, fundamentally um, recognizable to, f to find the universal and common uh, in, in the Russian uh, experience, to, to demystify the experience of, of what it is to be Russian and to live in Putin's Russia. I have lots of friends 
it's family who I talk to regularly and when I'm home in the US or meeting them elsewhere in Europe, they, they, they ask questions about, you know, what it's like to live in Moscow, presuming that it's, you know, what's it like to live on the moon, um, uh, right? Um, and I, I keep that in mind as I write, that I think a lot of readers have that idea in mind, that there must be something wholly different in, in maybe some inarticulable way, in a way that they themselves wouldn't even be able to exactly explain what is that difference, but they imagine as being somehow um, alien. Uh, and, and, and foreign to their reality uh, in the US or elsewhere in Europe. And I, I try to get across uh, in, in my pieces, both what is uniquely fascinating and rich about Russia, but at the same time to universalize and, and humanize that experience. Wonderful. We were just speaking before you came on about Orientalism and uh, how that might, you know, sort of norms of Orientalism, how that might apply to discourse about Russia. And I think that there is an application in your question speaks to that as well. We were discussing this idea of a presumption of Western rationalism and a presumption of Russian irrationalism, which is, after all, something that lies very deep uh, in uh, the history, not so much of Russia, but of Western Europe and, uh, and the United States. And uh, it does seem to me that one way of breaking that down, and I think that you do this uh, in such beautiful ways in your journalism, is through the act of translation broadly construed, that you try to translate uh, certain things. Sometimes it's language, sometimes it's historical experience, Sometimes it's other things. And that leads me to my uh, next question, uh, which uh, you've already uh, alluded to in two respects. You mentioned uh, Chekhov and you mentioned uh, portraiture. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, a lot of the foreign policy discussion of Russia uh, among English language, you know, sort of readers, policymakers, uh, politicians is fairly stark. Uh, there's often a kind of either or uh, quality to it. Um, if you had to put a literary label on it, you might describe it as Dostoevsky and you know, it's melodramatic and stark. Whereas I think the notes that you strike in a lot of your journalism, and especially in your book, uh, which is a book of portraits, it's a book of biographical uh, sketches, uh, is much more Chekhovian, which is to say that there's a lot of gray zones. I mean, Chekhov is the ultimate writer of uh, a world that's neither this nor that, but is very often in between this and that, that, that alludes uh, in some ways, the title of your book, Between uh, Two between two Fires. But I love the quality of in-betweenness that emerges in your portraits. I do think it's something that we very much need, uh, we who are not in Russia, sort of need to know about Russia. But I'm curious how you get to those portraits, how you choose them, uh, how you choose your subjects. I mean, of course, you could write what's now become a little bit of a standard issue piece on Dugan and the Eurasianists and their sort of over-the-top theories for uh, taking over Eurasia, you could do that sort of stuff, but you <laughs> you don't. Uh, and I'm curious how you get to these portraits that are surprising to, to non-Russian readers, uh, at the same time illuminating, sort of indicative. Uh, and with many of your portraits, I think of Konstantin Ernst, I myself can't quite make up my mind what to think about the man. He seems to have you know, many and contradictory char uh, characteristics, and, and, and I like that aspect very much of, of, uh, of how you write and what you write about. So I wanted to ask you about this portraiture uh, and these sort of Chekhovian uh, themes uh, and how you, when you choose what to write about or what to pitch your editors back in, uh, in New York, um, how you kind of come up with, uh, uh, with, these, with these themes. Uh, well, that's uh, such a delight, delight to hear about, uh, for example, your, your reaction to the Ernst chapter, because it was exact, exactly that effect that I was aiming for. I was, I was hoping to write about characters and, and bring to life characters who would essentially uh, confound the reader, just as they had honestly confounded me and, and, and defied my um, urges or inclinations to place them firmly in one uh, category to issue some resounding black or white uh, moral judgment. Uh, I found myself as a writer unable to do so. And, and while I'm not at all opposed, I, I, I don't resist when people who read the book do issue such proclamations and tell me, no, I actually think this or this, this or that character had you know, cross the line. I think their compromise in the end was, you know, not um, somehow um, uh, sort of stained, stained them in ir ir irrevocable ways. I, I don't push back, but I am always happy to hear of readers' encounters with the characters that, that mirror my own of this um, betweenness and, and never really finding a clear path um, out of that. And, and the way I achieved that, it, it, I don't know if this is kind of um, cheating or, or an unsatisfying answer is that I, I designed for that, I, I built that into uh, the book from the very beginning and I, and I sort of put on 
um, glasses or, 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 or filtered through the vast, infinite, potentially, cast of characters. When you sit down and write a book about Russia, you know, there's 130 million people to choose from. So how do you set about finding the six or eight, however many you want to write about? And I was pretty clear with myself from the very beginning that um, once I settled on this prism of compromise and, and the wily man, once I read that essay that, that forms the prologue to the book and, and gives the book its kind of motivating analytical um, framework or, or, or prism, um, I knew that it would be most interesting for me as a reporter and as a writer to find people who occupied these gray zones. That in fact, the country is full of people whose compromises are clearly um, unambiguously cynical, venal, self-serving, uh, not motivated by anything particularly uh, virtuous or, or redeemable um, and, you know, issuing a, a, a uh, clear judgment on, on their compromises in writing with a very heavy pen about them would be, would be easy and maybe satisfying in some way to kind of um, call out that form of um, corruption and in a way injustice that corruption um, perpetuates, but that was just not interesting to me. But, but I do want to acknowledge, and I, I hope I do in the book, that that very much exists in Russia. That's an absolute common, maybe even more common than the kind of compromise I describe, um, mode of, um, of existing and, and navigating through the world, but it just was less interesting to me to write about, so I filtered that out. And I also filtered out the pure heroes, the um, uh, kind of martyrs of Russian democracy and liberalism, um, opposition activists, people who were very uncompromising in uh, the degree to which they were willing to stand up to the state and bear the costs uh, for that. Such people also very much exist and, and they're worthy of our attention and admiration. And, and I do write about them in other ways and other articles and they certainly get a lot of attention. Maybe some would argue fairly too much attention in, in the Western press because that's a story that we're familiar with and, and we like to root for and, and, and should root for. I think there's nothing wrong with rooting for um, those who champion um, democracy over autocracy, but you know, if, if they're um, less representative than may seem in the pages of you know major newspapers, perhaps that gives a disservice to the reader. But um, I, I wanted to avoid them not because uh, not for that reason, not because I thought it was somehow you know would give the wrong kind of analytical impression to the reader, but it, it was just again less interesting to me as a reporter and as a writer. So this a lot of this was. Uh, effectively selfish, I guess you could say, in the sense that I, I wanted to find the kind of people who just motivated and excited me and who, if I'm going to spend two, three years on this project, um, who are the kind of people that are going to keep giving me that, I'm going to feel that intellectual uh, pull toward the attraction toward that I want to get to the bottom um, of their compromises and, 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 and not exactly solve this unsolvable conundrum, but, but kind of keep working through it, keep unraveling um, the thread uh, uh, maybe never getting to the end, but the process would be very intellectually stimulating. So um, I, I built that into my essentially casting call, I guess you could say, for, for how I thought about populating the book from the very beginning. And I only um, was looking for or, or, or tried to limit myself to people who occupied that state of betweenness that you said, people like Ernst, people who just when you thought, aha, I think I figured him out, you know, he actually, he's all about kind of his own uh, power and he actually bends his own ideas too far um, uh, that he's kind of lost any claim to still being a um, uh, an artist or an idealist just when you think you've reached that state of certainty the plot twists again and, and you see that actually maybe it's not so simple I, I wanted um, to find people like that and built that into my um, search and um, you know it's not that that also is not a, a small group of people at all um, in in Russia. I'd say the smallest group, just like it was in Soviet times, are the people who are resolutely uncompromising and live without compromise and bear the cost for that. That's a very small group, just like it was in Soviet times. Um, very few numerically dissidents uh, in, in Soviet era, I mean, minuscule, if you just look percentage-wise. Um, probably m more now, but, but still um, a, a, a numerically small um, uh, group. So I wanted to, to capture this much larger group of people who were in the middle and people who, who I recognized, who I felt the most um, 
familiar with, people actually that represented the kind of archetypes that I saw in my own life and in just uh, friends and, and colleagues in Moscow, that, that actually speaks very much to the cohort of people I know around me. I'm in my mid thirties um, and people of my generation in Moscow building their careers. Thankfully, I know very few people who are outright um, kind of cynical, uh, corrupt uh, sadists or manipulators. I, I don't um, have too many of those in my, my friend circle, but I also don't have too many um, to the barricades revolutionaries either. Most people who I know, who I meet uh, to get dinner with or used to do that when that was possible, um, uh, occupy this middle zone. And, and um, uh, I found myself very interested in their lives, just talking informally, nothing to do with journalism. And I felt that that was an important way of being that I wanted to bring to life um, on the page. Wonderful. I have one final question and then we'll take a, a you know, a break and, and uh, it, it will be the chance of the, uh, of the fellows to, uh, to ask their questions. Uh, and it's, we build this as an event about book reviewing among other things. And so I just wanted to follow through with a point that I made in my own review of your book in, in, in foreign affairs. And uh, it's about, um, maybe it's about another kind of book really, not, 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 not the one you've written, but another one that you could write. Uh, and it struck me that your cast of characters was of the older generation. So they were between two fires in the sense that they had been born and come of age in the Soviet Union. And then they were figuring out their professional paths uh, in the 90s and thereafter and making compromises, sort of uh, paving their way uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, and I was intrigued by this figure who shows up at the very end of your book. He asked this critical question of Putin on one of his marathon call-in shows. Uh, and the question was, um, I think, struck you for its critical force and also for the youth of the person asking it. And then you go to his town, which I can't quite remember the name, or, name of, but in Siberia, or sort of remote from Russia, from Moscow. Uh, and you're a bit surprised by him in the sense that he's critical of the government, but at the same time makes this claim about wanting to serve the, the homeland. So it's not, I mean, patriotism is not quite the right word. Nationalism certainly isn't, but uh, maybe nationhood would be the word. Um, uh, and just the kind of nationhood that's emerged after 1991 and how this looks in the eyes of, uh, of younger Russians. So I wanted to just give you a chance to, if it's a criticism, it's a criticism to sort of respond to that point in the review and, uh, and to respond to the point as I raise it now. Is there another book that one could write uh, about Russia that would sort of tell this story uh, as well? We're not now talking about in between this, but uh, the emergence, of course, of a complicated sense of nationhood, but uh, uh, of a sense of nationhood after 1991. Uh, sure, yeah, ab absolutely. And on the point of um, generational cleavages and, and not representing younger generations as much as I would have liked or, or could have been useful, that's a point well well taken. And that was the one, um, maybe the, at least the main, not the, not the only, but the main um, kind of self-criticism I, I have of the book is, is um, when I finish the reporting and writing or as I finished the reporting and kind of realized what I had, and it was too late to include a whole nother character or, or kind of go back to the drawing board in some big way. But, but I felt that um, uh, the part I hadn't designed for, but ended up with were people actually who were kind of in the same generational pool. I hadn't thought about that ahead of time. I think that's a function of just when in your life compromise kind of reveals itself, right? And, and then and reveals itself over a long enough period as to then make it, to give you enough kind of data points as a journalist to, to talk to a person about and inquire. And that just ends up, uh, you end up sucking up characters or, 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 or being, you know, gravitating to characters who are kind of in the same generational pool because you just need a certain amount of time in your life for these moments um, to reveal themselves. The character, uh, Daniel Priliapo, who you're referring to uh, in, the, in the last chapter, he had this one very interesting moment with Putin on the Colin show, but he hasn't yet faced all these questions that someone like Konstantin Ernst has. So there's just less material there and, and, and less, um, there's been less opportunity or less demands for compromise. So we haven't seen how someone like Danila will act, but how he will act is, is the great kind of mystery or, or question of the book's um, epilogue and, and in which I do spend time with um, young people, Danila uh, in particular, but also others. You know, what struck me about Danila and, and also other uh, young people of his generation, he, I guess, is actually by now 19 or, or 20. He was 18, or no, 
I'm getting it wrong. He was, he was more like 15 or 16 when, when he asked the question of Putin. So he's probably 18 um, uh, now. Um, that they, they, and it's a gross oversimplification, of course, but, but nonetheless, um, you know, allow me to speak with some generalities that are, of course, full of all sorts of um, exclusions and, and contradictions. But nonetheless, uh, what's striking about Danila and his cohort is they have this expectation that the state uh, essentially should work, for lack of a better word, and, and deliver on its promises uh, and are less wily in the sense that I use it. In other words, if the characters who populate most of the book don't really deep down, or even on the surface in some cases, expect the state to do all, all that much, they kind of take it for granted that the state is um, inefficient, distant, corrupt. They don't really ever um, you know, take seriously the notion that the state should just kind of function and deliver on its stated promises. They're, so they're very, um, from, from the very beginning, inclined or, 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 or primed in a way to, find, to use these compromises and to use their um, inner quote unquote wiliness uh, to navigate the world because they have no illusions about what the, the Russian uh, state is and, and what it can or, or cannot offer. They're, they're very clear eyed about that. In fact, that's a fundamental condition of wiliness in the way I use the term or in the way Levada used the term is, is, a, is a deep down, it may not always be expressed overtly, but deep down a real um, sub, sober, clear eyed understanding of, of all the state's uh, kind of deficiencies and its um, uh, failings, weaknesses, corruption. And even if you give that state or that system your outward loyalty, you're nonetheless um, looking to um, come up with all these kind of workarounds to, to, to get around or to make work a state that you know, you know doesn't really, um, isn't capable of working in the way it should. Whereas someone like Daniela and his friends, they have this expectation that they just, they're not um, yet uh, kind of oppositionists, revolutionaries, maybe they will become that, some of them, but, but for now they just expect, they have this um, kind of admirable expectation that the state should just do what it says, um, uh, it, it, it professes to kind of uh, to be able uh, to do. They just want a um, functional uh, state on, that they can rely on in some sense. Um, they don't want to have to come up with these uh, workarounds, these compromises, these kind of wily adaptations to the state um, or the system. They just uh, have this baseline expectation that the state should just function and allow them to um, kind of develop their lives and, the, and their careers. And so in that sense, someone like Daniela doesn't see it as any kind of contradiction to be um, sort of critical or, or um, questioning of corruption uh, of Putin and also wanting to become, and at least as he told me then, a, a military uh, pilot because he hasn't kind of made his peace with the fact that the Putin state is a kind of, you know, corrupt, uh, distant, cynical uh, machine. He's not at all kind of just come to terms with that and now going to spend his life finding these workarounds and adaptive mechanisms. Not at all. Like he's, that, that's not, he hasn't, um, Kind of accepted that and, and doesn't seem poised to. He wants the state to, to work and function and deliver um, on its promises. And so in that sense, why kind of, there's nothing contradictory or even strange about his um, belief in Russian uh, nationhood. I mean, the question is, you know, will reality, will experience change that um, view? I, that, I mean, that's like the great open question of the last chapter of the book. But for now, that attitude is something I noticed not just with Daniela, but with a lot of Russian uh, young people, this kind of a much higher, I guess higher, I think is, is the fair word to say, degree of expectation of what, um, of how they think the state should act and, how, and what they think the state should deliver on. That very much makes me want to ask about President Putin and the virus, but I'll, I'll leave my questions at that. And thank you for, um, uh, for all that you've said so far and contributed. And we'll take a 10 minute break now. I don't know, Darlift, if you want to jump in, but we'll take a 10 minute break and I think we can just leave our, uh, sort of feeds on and 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 uh, and 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 plug back in at at, uh, at one ten. <laughs> 